through aid for trade, it is possible to provide the necessary environment, uh, investment climate and necessary business environment, and also provide project preparation grant or other kinds of seed facility in order to uh, mobilize other kinds of resources. And there, therein, the ESG investment, the, the environment, social and governance investment and blended finance uh, discussion need to be brought to the forefront. An example of leveraging um, I can provide from the EIF is the support that we have provided to create e-marketplace in Cambodia, where we provided 1.5 million US dollar to the government of Cambodia, Ministry of Commerce, to roll out this initiative. And they were able to mobilize additional $1.2 million from other partners such as UNDP, UNCTAD, uh, UPU, United uh, Post Postal Union, then also a Swiss contact and Khmer Enterprises. So that's one example of leveraging, not quite from the private sector, but from other, uh, not fully from the private sector, but from other partners. And other example of resource leveraging, not from the EIF context is the, um, is the project uh, called Mozambique Malawi Interconnector Support Project. Uh, it is um, a project which combines electron, electric transmission line with um, fiber optic cable, where the total cost was 108 million euro, out of which uh, KFW, the German uh, Development Bank, and World Bank contributed bulk of the resources, but then they also mobilized additional resources from European Union and Norway to complete this project. So that is another example. Then the third point that I would like to make is that there is a need for tailored approach to ensure that no one is left behind. It is so important for LDCs, but also digital trade is important for LDCs, but also for um, the seeds countries, you know, where Commonwealth works a lot, actually our partners, uh, small island developing states and countries affected by fragility and conflict. They need the, this kind of support. But at the same time, even within those countries, there are certain segments, vulnerable segments, such as women and uh, micro, small and medium enterprises who need support. Therefore, the aid for trade support should be targeted to those uh, groups also. So uh, there are a few examples. Just one example that I would like to highlight here is the initiative that we have launched with the UNSCAP in uh, New Delhi to train 1,900 women entrepreneurs on, um, on digital marketing and e-commerce. So this is one initiative that we have launched and there are various other initiatives together with ITU, UNCTAD. We are working with other partners also in order to build capacity of women um, entrepreneurs as well. So, but then, you know, having said that it is not going to be enough. What is important is that we need to work together with other partners. Partnership is extremely important. And this is one of the added value of the EIF. Um, and today, uh, that's a, the, the reflection of that partnership. You can see today in the event that we are organizing, uh, organizing together with Commonwealth Secretariat, and we have expertise from the WTO, UNCTAD, ITC, and most importantly, from LDCs as well as the academic uh, institution. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all the uh, members of the panels, moderator and participants, both in person and online, and look forward to a productive engagement. Now I would like to hand over to the moderator, Natalie Domson uh, of ITC, where she heads publishing and event management and provides advocacy support to digital trade for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And welcome to everyone today. Um, as you've just heard, my name is Natalie Domeisen. I'm your moderator. I come from the International Trade Center, also based in Geneva. For those of you who don't know us, we are the agency that connects small business to international markets. And I'm happy to say that digital has been a really big part of the work that we're doing and the work that I do in managing ITC's publications program and the events, including our annual World Export Development Forum. And you're going to be hearing um, from a lot of interesting people today. And this first panel session will be about setting the scene with Simon Vashti, who I'll introduce to you in just a minute. But I'd like to just say, when we're talking about the capacity building that you're going to hear, um, 
some of the work that ITC is doing is actually quite interesting, and you might be willing to take a little peek at that. We're going to have a book coming up very soon on tech hubs in the post-COVID era. We're about to publish uh, data from Alibaba for Asian SMEs and how they can uh, tailor their, their um, market access to the most interesting products. We have reports on customs and taxes in the EU and the US. Uh, we've published on e-platforms for SMEs. Uh, we've looked at the border on customs issues and technology. And uh, most importantly, we had a flagship publication launch at the end of September. And we talked about the role of services for countries around the world. And there were four that came out that were really the most important. And ICT was one of the four. Uh, let's see if I remember, four is a tough number. FinTech, ICT, Business and Professional Services. What's the other one? I have a gap, brain blip. Doesn't matter, we're on ICTs today. And the point is that, as you'll also hear in just a minute, they're an important part of the economies and they are in their own right and they're an important part to make the rest of the economy work. And the distinctions between digital trade and trade are getting slimmer and slimmer. And if you look at the past 30 years, the past 10 years, you look at the COVID era, this wheel is spinning faster and faster, more in this direction. So this is a really, really timely and important event here today. And with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, and that's Simon Lacey. And he's written an important work coming out of the Aid for Trade discussions uh, and his other research that he's been doing. He's a senior lecturer in international trade at the University of Adelaide School of Economics and Public Policy, so coming all the way from Australia. And he's also worked at Huawei, and he's had many other interesting uh, things that he's done both in the private sphere and in the public sphere. And so that has definitely enriched the public, the, the findings that he's going to share with you today, giving an overview on what do LDCs need to uh, do to jumpstart digital trade and where and what can we do in terms of aid for trade as priorities? Over to you, Simon. Thank you uh, for that um, lovely introduction and thanks to the Commonwealth Secretariat and the Enhanced Integrated Framework for inviting me here today. It's uh, it's great to be back in Geneva after just having spent a week here for the public forum only a month ago. Uh, the weather actually has gotten better um, since I was last here. It's actually gotten warmer than it was uh, a month ago. It's also great to be back on a panel um, and, and in a room with uh, with uh, some old um, friends and colleagues, so Ratnaka, uh, Michael, uh, Roberts, and, and Turbion. I feel like we're getting the band back together since we've sort of spoken on this subject um, so many times in, in so many different places. Um, for Ratnaka, I think the last time... Uh, we we were together on on something like this was in um, was in Shaman in in China if you remember right anyway um, let me uh, sort of launch into this this is really uh, a summary of a thirty plus page paper I wrote uh, last year for the Commonwealth Secretariat on aid for digital trade where we we really sort of tried to do two things so the first of which uh, was to figure out how much of sort of aid for trade or, or ODA, so official development assistance, spending on trade-related technical assistance was going to help beneficiary countries, was intended to help beneficiary countries better connect with digital value chains or to help firms in these countries better um, participate in, in the digital economy. Now, the second thing the paper um, tried to do uh, was, was sort of make the case uh, and argued that digital transformation should be placed at the very heart of the digital um, or, or the aid for trade agenda by, by sort of relaunching or reimagining um, aid for trade as aid for, for digital trade. Um, I think I, I have a copy um, of the paper. Oh, there it is. Yep, uh, it's right there on your screen. So, so have a look at that um, and uh, go to the, the Commonwealth Secretary website. You can, you can download that. Turning now to the substance of this presentation, this is essentially a talk in four parts where we begin by contextualizing where we are today in the aid for trade debate by looking at the evolution of this phenomenon, 
um, which I'll do immediately after uh, do immediately after this. And then um, I turn to a discussion on the digital dimension of international trade, how trade has become uh, digitized. And after that, uh, I discuss why digital should be at the heart of aid for, of the aid for trade agenda. And, and then uh, the talk concludes with some concrete recommendations on how to do uh, exactly that. So we begin by discussing um, the evolution of aid for trade. So those of us who are old enough to remember, and I sort of count myself as, as part of uh, that crowd, can actually recall how this all got started, namely in December 2005 at the Ministerial Conference in Hong Kong. I was actually uh, in Hong Kong as part of a delegation to the, the conference, and I remember that it was Japan that first dropped a uh, proposal on this, followed um, very quickly uh, by the US and the EU. Now, at the time, this was about um, revitalizing LDC engagement in the by then sort of flagging Doha development round where developing countries and LDCs in particular had, had soon come to realize that the word development in the Doha process was just sort of a rhetorical convention or a manifestation of, of um, the law of inverse relevance, which says the less you want to actually do about something, the more you have to talk about it. And Aid for Trade was an attempt, not the first and also not the last, to give developing countries more of a stake in the business of the WTO. Now, that may sound somewhat cynical, but you know those were the humble beginnings of, of this program. And I think nobody is more surprised than I am at just how um, visible and central aid for trade has become to the development related work of the WTO and actually how much of a positive contribution aid for trade um, has actually had. So conceptually aid for trade was about tackling supply side constraints as well as being part of the process launched in 2000 in the early 2000s to mainstream trade related technical assistance into ODA efforts. And it began um, with uh, a stock taking and, and benchmarking exercise to identify what these supply side constraints were and how best to address them. Fast forward to 2013, and you had a very interesting evolution in how Aid for Trade reviews and how the whole agenda began to both present itself, but also, um, uh, but also uh, realign efforts along sort of thematic headings which helped to give a greater sense of unified purpose to these activities. So in 2013, this was done uh, under the heading of connecting to value chains. In 2015, uh, the focus was on reducing trade costs, which coincided uh, with efforts at the time to ratify the 2013 Trade Facilitation Agreement, the primary focus of which was, was to do exactly that, to, to reduce trade costs. Um, for our purposes today, I think the, the 2017 review was the moment where the digital in aid for trade had sort of undeniably arrived with, with a focus on connectivity. Then in 2019, uh, the focus was on economic diversification and empowerment before uh, in 2022, returning again to the connectivity agenda uh, of which digital is of course um, a, a key uh, part. So moving on, I, I don't wanna to spend too much sort of time reliving the good old days or dwelling on the past because um, I only have 25 minutes, but it helps to put this all in some kind of historical context, which we'll, which we'll come back to later. Um, let's move on now to how digital technologies and processes have become so fundamental to international trade. So I think when you discuss the digital dimension in international trade, you're essentially uh, asking three questions. So the first is, what makes a given transaction one that is inherently part of the digital economy? Uh, the second is what constitutes digital trade? And the third is what rules or disciplines are emerging to govern digital trade? So let's start by tackling the first of these questions, namely, what do you mean when you're talking about digital? So in my last job, um, working in the trade team of Huawei Technologies in China, we did a very sort of expansive white paper on this. And we began by trying to define what made a given transaction part of the digital economy, as opposed to say, just a conventional or legacy transaction. Uh, and we, we soon came to the conclusion that thanks to um, the overarching trend of convergence, the digital and the analog economies were fast just sort of becoming the economy, making any distinction between the two uh, increasingly sort of relevant and artificial. But for the sake of argument, we, we concluded that in order to qualify as part of the digital economy, a given transaction or process had to both take place via 
or be intrinsically contingent to online connectivity, while at the same time being data centric, meaning it relied on or facilitated the collection, processing, transmission of data over data over either the subjects to the transaction or the objects of the transaction. And that probably sounds needlessly complicated, but you know, think about any transaction that takes place in the modern day economy, you know, whether you go in to buy a coffee at a store or whether you um, and, and you pay by credit card or you pay by a digital wallet uh, or you, you go online and you order a, a book on, on Amazon. Um, and you'll find that both of these elements, online connectivity and data centricity, uh, are, are both central to the way different parties interact with each other commercially today. Um, going back to our three questions, um, let's look at the second one, what constitutes digital trade? Um, so here, a lot of good analytical work has been done by organizations such as the OECD, but also the IMF, as well as the WTO. And here I've listed a number of sort of typologies on, on trying to organize uh, what different kind of trade transactions exist um, uh, in the digital realm. For the sake of time, I won't read them to you. You can find this infographic in the publication, which I'll again uh, plug here, which you can go online uh, and see. Um, you can also think about this in definitional terms. Um, here I've included three. So the first of this, first of these three definitions is from the IMF. Um, the second of these is from the OECD. And the third is the one I helped develop when I wrote the, the Huawei white paper um, that I was talking about before on, on trade rules for the digital economy. Um, going back to our, the third of our, our sort of three questions on the digital dimension of international trade um, and, and looking at sort of the rules. Um, Talking about digital trade rules, there are various ways of, of doing this, of course. As, as someone with a background in law, I always found it easier to distinguish between those provisions that are best characterized as sort of soft, um, so comprising kind of best endeavor obligations on, on the one hand, compared to those provisions intended to be more binding in their legal effect on the other. You can also look at this through a more sort of public public policy uh, analytical lens where you can distinguish these two sets of provisions by virtue of how easy they are for governments to adopt in terms of their opportunity costs, uh, the, the political capital they require to enact, and the degree to which they require governments to forsake or relinquish some degree of regulatory sovereignty. So the low-hanging low fruit here comprises uh, commitments that governments are often quite willing to make since they don't cost them anything, Whereas the second set of commitments, um, which I refer to as the tough stuff, uh, are those provisions that some governments with stronger offensive interests are pushing quite assertively. Uh, and that's being resisted equally assertively by governments um, whose interests in the digital economy are more defensive. Uh, and that, that can be for political economy reasons or because you know, the liberalization of digital trade plays plays second fiddle to other more important policy priorities, which again sort of brings us back to this idea of regulatory sovereignty. To conclude this section on rules, I think it's a it's important to note that a completely different, but for our purposes here, um, infinitely more interesting question as to how the digital trade rules we currently have or that are currently emerging are likely to impact development outcomes in those countries on the verge of adopting or implementing them. That's a that's an infinitely um, more interesting question. Um, uh, Sergio Martinez, are you over there, Sergio? Sergio is, is doing a PhD on that under uh, Simon Evenet in St. Gallen. So he's, he's the guy to sort of talk to about that. Let's look now at why, um, why digitize aid for, aid for trade. So, you know, this whole uh, agenda that we're pushing, make digital the center of aid for trade. Um, you know, why, why do we want to do that? Why are we advocating that? So, there are many upsides to digital trade compared to the analog or more conventional forms of trade. So the most common manifestation of, of this sort of more analog conventional form of trade is just shipping goods across borders. Now, I've listed some of the, the sort of upsides of digital trade here. Um, and I've, I've given sort of, I think, five uh, going in sort of reverse um, clock, clockwise order. So, you know, you've got lower barriers to entry lower operating costs than many brick and mortar businesses, less exposure to the vicissitudes of economic geography, um, lower trade costs for digital products uh, than for conventional goods because they don't need to deal with customs or inspection, 
um, minimal to non-existent transport costs for digital products, obviation of the need to obtain, to obtain trade finance for products that are digitally traded. And then lastly, um, greater market transparency and smaller information asymmetries just because of the sort of large amount of data that these transactions um, uh, inevitably um, generate. And once you establish and recognize just how much easier it can be to do business in the digital economy um, with digital or digitally enabled business models, then you can articulate why it's so important that we have a digital first strategy in aid for trade. Uh, and here I've, I've listed five reasons. Um, first of all, the, the economic and other benefits of digital transformation. So these can be thought of in terms of first and second order economic impacts. So the first order effects are the sort of the economic activity that is generated by building and operating the networks and devices uh, that the digital economy relies upon. Whereas the second order effects, and this is where sort of most of the value uh, can be found, consists of all of the sort of over the top functionality that these networks enable and, and the business models uh, that can be built with this functionality. In terms of the, the gains from digital trade, um, I think this was best summed up by um, one of the most articulate and unrelenting advocates of digital trade, Kati Swarman, and I've also you know, been on many panels with, and she referred to this as the, the holy grail of world trade, seamless integration and automation of the informational, financial, and physical supply chains that undergird trade transactions. And really many of the gains from digital trade, uh, many of the benefits of, of digital trade were laid out in my previous slides. So I won't go into them in more detail here. Confronting economic realities um, is yet another reason to place digital at the heart of the aid for trade agenda. And this is because to do so aligns with the reality that I, that I touched on before of, of convergence, namely that the digital economy is soon just becoming the economy and being at the forefront of digitization means being able to produce and export uh, at, at, at the forefront of the technological frontier, which is really where you need to be if you wanna be globally competitive uh, and, and connect with global value chains. The fourth, um, the dangers of falling behind, that's what I like to call sort of the fear factor, which simply means that failure to keep up to date with technological advances, um, including digital, primarily digital, will simply mean that developing countries risks, risk falling further behind and firms in these countries risk becoming increasingly sidelined by their competitors in other markets who embrace and adopt these technologies as soon as they become available. And the fifth point for why we need a digital first strategy with aid for trade uh, is, is the fact that the WTO is, is the optimal um, forum for, for doing this, the optimal place for having these conversations um, and, and for these efforts to be both articulated and coordinated. And this is for a number of reasons. So the first of which is because from the earliest days of its inception, the aid for trade agenda has been about donor countries working together um, with their development partners to identify and formulate strategies for overcoming constraints to, um, to greater participation by developing countries in, in, in global markets. And, and this, you know, overcoming constraints is really central to the challenges of, of digital transformation and, and overcoming the digital divide. A second reason why the WTO is the place to do this and the aid for trade agenda is, to do the, is the place to do this is because of the sheer sort of breadth and depth of technical expertise and development resources that the institutional players supporting aid for trade bring to bear. So this includes the OECD, um, but it also includes the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Enhanced Integrated Framework. It includes the ITC, which has some amazing tools to help SMEs in developing countries connect with export markets. It includes UNCTAD, which has for many years now been helping developing countries become better prepared to engage, to engage in global e-commerce. But it also includes Michael Roberts and his small but committed team of aid for trade warriors at the Secretariat. So really there's no better organizational framework for managing and implementing these efforts than, than the aid for trade agenda. And so, you know, that finally that, that I'll conclude with some recommendations on how to go about doing this in practice. Um, and I, I essentially have sort of six uh, recommendations here. So um, mainstreaming digital into trade and development, just how we mainstream trade into, devel into development, this is really important because of the way that digital technologies have come to dominate so many facets of economic life today. And this is even more compelling um, when you recognize the many development gains that have already um, been proven to follow when digital transformation is embraced. And the World Bank has some great research and data 
on this. The second is, is build the infrastructure. So finance it, build it, and make sure it is embedded in sort of adequate and effective policy framework so that the benefits of building this new infrastructure are passed on to, to users. So here the numbers really speak for themselves with some data published in early 2021 showing that over 40% of the world's population was still without access to the internet as of the end of 2020, meaning that these people live in a world bereft of all the productivity and lifestyle enhancing uh, changes ushered in by these technology, by these technologies. This is something that's kind of well understood today by, by, the, by the policy experts, by the community of, of um, policymakers, but sadly uh, still poorly addressed by, by governments. Then there's the need to focus on digital skills and adoption. And this is about imparting skills to all users, first by embedding them in school curricula, but also making sure that those elements of the population who are no longer at school have access to easy and affordable ways in which to learn uh, how to, to use these technologies. E-government to improve business and regulatory environments. So this means forcing governments at all levels to go digital. And this has both sort of important demonstration effects for economies and societies as a whole, but also helps in the sort of upskilling of the entire ecosystem of private citizens and firms who avail themselves of government services. And it's also proven uh, to have positive spillover effects um, on improving governance by reducing corruption and promoting transparency. Financial inclusion and lowering the barriers to formalization. So this is already an area where the development community is actively involved in supporting the adoption of fintech and digital financial services, including mobile money, working with governments and the private sector to achieve greater financial inclusion. So digital technologies and platforms um, today are, are key enablers for access to affordable financial services. And they're also so fundamental in supporting you know, poverty reduction and economic growth. We've seen that in India, for example. And what is more, given the, the suitability of these technologies to enabling cross-border e-commerce and other international trade transactions, there's a compelling reason to strengthen efforts to promote both fintech solutions and digital financial services in the context of current and future aid for trade initiatives and to direct them at sort of real world problems um, such as, you know, to name just one example, the massive gap that has emerged in trade finance um, since the, the global financial crisis. And then the final point is, you know, to get donors, developing countries and the private sector working together. You know, this is an area where each of these different groups or stakeholders has a unique set of skills and expertise that they have to combine in order to bring about effective solutions. So, you know, what are those, those areas of skills? So policymakers in recipient countries have, have the best understanding of what constraints should be tackled and in what order of priority, since they, they're, they're best placed to understand what these constraints are, what the constraints are holding their economies back. The private sector is the only place that has the technical expertise to roll out online connectivity and digital te technologies. And it's donor governments that have the funds and the will to contribute these funds to supporting the digital aid for trade priorities that policymakers in developing countries identify. So this is yet another area where a multi-stakeholder approach is required in order to achieve tangible outcomes. So I'll say um, thank you, uh, and I'll also plug um, my paper last time, which you can um, download from uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat, Sec Commonwealth, Commonwealth Secretariat website. So thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. I think we've given everyone some food for thought. Uh, there's no surprise maybe in hearing about connectivity, but that number 40% is a really, really big number. Um, and we've heard about the importance of skills, e-governance, and the whole fintech, um, mobile money, and all these kinds of things. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Vashti who's coming from the, the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, Vashti lives and breathes this topic. She is the advisor for digital trade policy uh, at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And she's part of a multidisciplinary team who's working on trade and investment issues uh, all the time on this. And she's worked in e-governance, e-commerce, telecommunications, IP, cybersecurity. So quite a range of topics. And she is here to provide her insights based on her day-to-day -day, uh, life to what we've just heard about. Over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. And I'd like to commend Simon for a very, very good presentation. And for those who had the opportunity to read it, 
it's a very good overview of the fundamentals of digital trade and also in, in a nuanced way bring it together to why we should look at putting it at the forefront in the aid for trade strategy. My role in this conversation is really to bring a practical element in terms of an application of how this impacts lesser developed countries, small island developing states, not just because I come from a small island developing state, but because I work with a lot of them on a daily basis. And I'd like to see or start by saying digital trade is not new. It's not anything that fell out of the sky that is something that's a new concept. It has been around for a really long time. You'd find that many governments across the world, particularly in developing countries, have national ICT plans, have national e-government strategies. But, and this would have included elements of digital trade. What would have had a catalytic effect with regard to putting it at the forefront is something that impacted everyone around the world you'd find that the global pandemic, as well as recent global disruptions, has really forced a lot of governments worldwide to look towards the digitalization of their trade and even governmental processes to thrive and survive as part of the digital economy. So in addition to some of these statistics that Simon would have very eloquently put forward in his paper, you'd find that in a recent Aid for Trade review, the statistics are, are quite glaring. You'd find that during the pandemic in 20, 2021, you have 800 million new users of e-services. And that impacts both developing countries as well as developed countries. And you'd also find, I mean, for me, this is great because I love digital trade. I want everybody to be on board, but you'd find that 64% of exports and services is digitally rendered. So where does that put us now in terms of looking at how to best serve the needs of developing countries and small island developing states? I would say that, I mean, this is going to sound like almost uh, heretic of me, but while digital technology has a catalytic effect in driving trade, it's not a panacea, but it is a tool. And in looking at digital trade, you'd find that there are many different forms of technology that are applied across the board by different governments in order to digitalize their trade process flows. What we are looking at is what makes the greatest impact upon each country. And it therefore involves taking into consideration that different countries have different levels of digital maturity and digital readiness. So in looking at how best to render assistance to developing countries through aid for trade, I would suggest that you take an individualistic approach and understand that digital trade is not just the infrastructure and the access and the last mile, but it also involves a series of layers. It involves enabling legislation. It also involves upskilling your workforce. And it's something that I can tell you in dealing with the Pacific, in dealing with African member states, and in dealing with Caribbean member states, that incidentally enough from the recent reports received the least amount of assistance from aid to trade, you find that, do you know what kind of assistance they're asking for? The assistance to allow for them to build their legislative frameworks, to be able to create new laws and policies and regulations so that when they embrace technology, they're able to have legal recognition and ability to use it in a meaningful way to transform their government. So, you know, some of the things we might need to look at firstly is placing emphasis on the foundational element. Good examples would be that in liaising with the CARICOM Competition Commission recently, we're now commissioning a project to look at consumer protection and data protection within the new digitalized environment. Because you find that, as you would have pointed out in your paper, Simon, there is digitalization, there are digitally rendered services, but you find that there are huge competition issues when you have large multinational players coming into the space. And then where does that put our MSMEs? Where does that put our small, 
but very, very talented vendors that we want to ensure that is part of that global trade ecosystem. So you'd find that that is one of the things that you know, we would like to advocate looking at. The second thing is that while physical infrastructure forms the baseline for connectivity, you have to ensure that the people who are going to use the technology are able to use it and use it well to their benefit. So it's something that um, was touched on by your paper. And I would indicate that it's a second pillar and a core area that merits looking at intently, but on an individual country to country basis, the building of digital school skills in order to bridge that digital divide. And you know, in traditional terms, when we think of the digital divide, like many, many moons ago, participating in the ITU process, people think the digital divide is an access problem. It's an issue with connectivity. Um, being online. But really, the digital divide is much more than that. In fact, there is not a lack of wanting to, but sometimes and most times, it's a lack of being able to, the skill. And this pertains to not just women and girls and small and medium enterprises, but you want to look at upskilling and retooling traditional members of your traditional sectors in order to become equipped with new services in order to be part of that digital economy. So in looking at ways in which aid for trade can make that most pointed impact, when looking at the digital divide, it is important to put in place investment in the people that power the process of trade. And um, it's something that you had spoken to, Ratnika, and, and I endorse it fully. We sometimes, look at the forest and, and we lose part of the great big picture. Digital trade does not involve one country dealing only with another country. Digital trade is globalized in nature. So it means that in looking at how we're going to really utilize aid for trade to best be able to make an impact, it is important to look at working on a regional level with the regional organization that are working across the board with different countries within, within the different regions, because chances are, and in many times the case, these regional bodies have their finger on the ball because their heads of government provide input into what is needed the most. So you'd find that in looking at a regional approach to digital trade, they would be ensuring that there is a coordinated and harmonized approach, and it avoids duplication and lack of interoperability. I'm sure many of you here in this room are aware that within each region, there are several donor bodies that are doing several great projects, and they're aiming to do many, many great things, but they're not really collaborating. They're, and sometimes, this actually involves a lot of resource and, and capacity overspent. You also find that member states end up doing the same thing twice or in a not structured way. And it creates a disjointed approach to digital trade when in reality, digital trade is a globalized phenomenon and it involves countries now being able to be interoperable in their approach. So as you know, advocated, in looking at how best to maximize on aid for trade and helping out developing countries. It would be great to look at regional bodies and collaboration between development partners and even the public sector partners. We have found that one of our greatest partners within recent time has been the International Chamber of Commerce that is working on the harmonization of standards to allow for countries to be able to share common approaches towards digital trade. So I hope that it's given you some food for thoughts and um, I would hand it over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much. And just to recap for everyone, if I caught you properly, we talked first about a more general scene setting and now you've come in and you've said, it's not enough to be connected. E-culture really matters. This is intangible and it's not easy for people to put their fingers on it. And it varies from country to country. 
and it varies even between regions. And that takes you to regional partners who have an important role working with the public and private sector to work particularly in two areas, one being to enable the legislative frameworks, which are really going to differ again from country to country. And another one is to upskill the workforce so that you are moving from traditional trade to digital trade. And so they so that it becomes part of a culture because you're going through all of this training. That's what I think I'm hearing from you. And I'm hearing about harmonizing and interoperability, that that also matters because yes, it does matter it does. from so many different angles. Um, with that, um, thank you very much. I think they've been very interesting perspectives. And I realize I haven't told you about our housekeeping rules, which is, um, first of all, hello to everyone who's um, listening hybrid. You've heard a hello before, but you haven't heard it from me. And I hope that you are putting questions into the chat because there are people who are, uh, Inga and Marie, I believe are looking at our chats for us. They're in the back of the room there. They're following that. And they will be able to tell us if there's any questions that go to our panelists. And for those of you, I hope you found the button for the French who are online. Um, certainly, if in your room, you know how to use the, the French interpretation here. And um, I can see that everyone has been holding their questions, but we're coming now to the time where we can move into the Q&A. And I'd love to hear, you know, do you agree with these priorities? Do you have more questions to go in depth? Let's turn it over to Marie, who's going to start with some questions from the floor. Yes. So we have the re received the question from Shamira Amhed online. In the context of LDCs, many of which are late adopters of the internet and weak data-driven digital trade endowment, will the dividend from digital trade for LDCs be more equitable than the analog model? Will it be more equitable? Okay, yeah, I, I saw this um, question from Shamira Ahmed, um, who I believe is from South Africa. Um, and and I, I, I thought about this, my, you know, my, my first reaction was, well, you know, more equitable, um, less equitable. I mean, you're always going to have, you, you know, inequalities, um, and you're you're always going to have, um, you know, some that move faster than others. I, I think I think the, um, the the short answer is is yes, because um, digital trade does allow you to overcome um, many of the constraints that that um, are particularly burdensome on LDCs. Things like trade costs, things like economic geography. Um, uh, trade finance, uh, some of those, some of those issues where um, digital trade really helps you um, uh, have that, the sort of highest incidence in LDCs, and so that's why I think the answer is, is yes. But you know, you shouldn't um, think that we're eventually going to live in a world where there'll be you know no inequality or everyone you know every we're going to have complete uh, equality of of outcomes. I think that's not that's also not the purpose, right? I mean the the, the the, the purpose is to have um you know equality of opportunities and i think i think that's something that digital trade really really does help with uh, also in ldcs okay over to you thank you very much uh, similar to simon's response but it is it is important to uh, you know understand that yes digital economy can be a leveler uh, because uh, of several factors, including those that you mentioned, um, getting rid of intermediaries uh, and connecting directly to the end user, to the buyer, is one example of uh, sort of one major advantage of digital trade that is offered to particularly to micro, small, and medium enterprises who need to otherwise rely on intermediaries. Is, is something that I could think of. Uh, and then reducing trade cost uh, is another. Uh, but I will qualify by saying but, because 
you need to do that. If you need to do that, you need to have precisely the points that Simon highlighted and then also uh, Vasti also uh, indicated or uh, uh, supported them. You need to mainstream digital in the overall trade and development architecture. You need to have the required policies and regulation. You need to have the necessary skill and the possibility of applying those skills in order to take advantage of the opportunities. And you need to have infrastructure for which, now we come back to the same thing, resource constraint LDCs will have to at least for the time being, rely on aid for trade resources and how to utilize aid for trade resources, going back to my earlier point, to leverage additional resources. It's very important. Basti? Yes, bridging the digital divide, it's, it will not make the world flat, unfortunately. Um, but what it can do is provide a chance for persons who would not otherwise be able to access markets, be part of that global playing field. And, you know, it's something that I'd like you to consider as a food for thought. It's not just about moving from analog to digital, because I think we've all traded in our CDMA phones a long, long time ago. It's that what is very curious is that you find that with a lot of the young SMEs and young burgeoning businesses that are coming into the game, they are looking at the new technology. They're looking at blockchain. They are looking at artificial intelligence and big data and how they can use that in order to expand their global reach. And you'd find that within particularly Africa and the Pacific, we have an emergence of an interest in digital agriculture and digital fisheries, and we're doing projects with that. So you find that it's not just about leveling the playing field, it's about using that digital advantage to give you the advantage in a way that best suits your needs. So for instance, the Bahamas and the OECS of the Caribbean have their own central bank digital currencies because of the pandemic, but because of natural disasters. African states through M-Pesa and, and other forms of financial technologies are bridging that gap to have more financial inclusion. So it's really about how to bridge the digital divide, but how to do it in a way that works for you. So there's no simple solution or there's no simple formula. And I think um, that... Thank you. Um, I think I would like to add something from the International Trade Center's experience on this. Um, we agree that it's not a panacea, but it is going to help to um, make trade more equitable. And we have a lot of surveys that show, particularly for women entrepreneurs and for young entrepreneurs, when they're working um, with in the in the digital sphere, maybe you don't see them face to face. And so the prejudices that might be facing them in some of the more traditional channels, you don't see them in this world. So for me, that is already a plus point in terms of becoming more equitable. Um, then the other point we've been talking about very much is it's ICT within a context. And I want to go back to our, our SME competitiveness outlook report. Those four sectors were ICT, transport, that was the missing uh, one I wanted to mention, fintech, and business and professional services. So if you have ICT in a vacuum, it's only gonna take you so far. If, you have, if you're getting e-commerce up and going, then, and you don't have the transport in place to get those products to where they have to go if you're not delivering services, let's say, you're going to have a challenge. And our research has shown that in regions where you have a, a good strong presence with those four services, that 44% of small firms are exporting and where you don't have that, you have those weak connections, weak in those four services, it's only 19%. And we know that the small businesses that do better are the ones who manage to at least get across the borders and trade with their neighbors. So it is important to think about this in a holistic context. Um, I think it's been very interesting to hear about all of the different organizational experiences and how we're, we're very much in line, even though we have different slightly different perspectives. Do we have more questions from the audience? Quite a few coming in. 
Oh, who? Okay, where are you from? Can you state your name and your organization, please? Sure. Uh, I'm Dr. Muhammad uh, Yasin, um, and I'm coming from the University of Lille, where I'm doing master's degree on global e-business. Right, which country, please? Uh, originally from Sudan. Up to October, I was the first under secretary for federal governance in Sudan before the COP did that. Then I came, I, and I'm, now I'm back to the academy. Uh, uh, while uh, I was in the government, I was uh, struggling to put in place uh, e-governance system and uh, e-digital uh, e-commerce to help uh, the left uh, behind people. And in that, I was uh, I got uh, substantial finance from the World Bank. To but unfortunately, this this. Uh, project was put on hold due to the, the military COVID that. But uh, my, let me go, come back to my question. I have a question here uh, to all of you. Now there is uh, this uh, uh, African Free Continental Trade Area Agreement entering into force. So how do you think this will uh, uh, facilitate and accelerate the uh, inclusion in the global uh, uh, e-business uh, and what could be done by that and then also a question can this uh, urine institution help also in provision of uh, simple uh, applications for the uh, small and medium sized uh, uh, companies in in the, in, the, in the continental in the african continent in order to include them uh, uh, that is because uh, they are lacking uh, platforms where they can uh, maybe benefit and get into the, the global marketplace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's take a few questions and then we'll let the panelists answer them. There were some from this side of the room. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Turbjörn Fredriksson from Anktel. And uh, I just wanted to reflect on what was said about the, whether it will be more equitable or not. I think it all depends. And that's exactly why we're here today. Uh, digital trade is not a predetermined trajectory. It very much depends on the policies and rules and regulations that are set up and the initiatives taken. Uh, and uh, anything linked to digitalization is disrupted by nature. So there will be winners and losers. Uh, and uh, so far, what we have learned during the pandemic is that rather than ha uh, digitalization has acted as an equalizer, it has really widened the inequalities and divides. So it, it is nothing that we can take for certain that it will be an equalizer, even in the long term. It very much depends on what we do with it. Uh, so that, I think, is why it's also too important to consider what kind of support mechanisms are needed to ensure that it doesn't become a great divider rather than an equalizer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's more of a question on how do we make sure it's equitable on the government front. And there was a question from the back. That's from my colleague, Kyle at ITC. Hi, I'm Kyle from ITC. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question for Vashti regarding harmonization. Um, I mean, recently we've seen countries unfortunately throw up many barriers to digital trade in the form of localization requirements. And that's something that I think the AFCFTA is really seeking to try and harmonize. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how best to approach the issue, because it seems as though kind of the export of regulatory frameworks from developed countries is, is creating fears of the creation of a splinter net. Um, and that perhaps, you know, the dream of a global digital economy may die and the splinter net may rise in its place. So I'm just I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on on how best we can approach the harmonization issue. We have other questions. That was a question on localization, the splinter net, harmonization, maybe. Who else has questions for us? Well, do we want to take more? Can we go with these three, maybe? And then we'll come back and see if there's more from the chat. So who would like to answer? Who would like to start? AFCFTA, what's the role in accentuating um, a good process to include, especially SMEs, um, platforms 
we had a question around what can we do to make sure that it does go towards equ equitable and not the other direction. And we had a question around localization. You want to start with localization, maybe? Inevitably, this data question has to come up. <laughs> but it is something that is being grappled with by many jurisdictions because of the fact that with greater digitalization, you have vast amounts of data. And um, there are new forms of technology that utilize data, big data systems, as well as the internet of things. So it's everywhere, all around. How do we deal with that in terms of a harmonization perspective? You will find that different countries, as you would notice, have different approaches with regard to how they treat with your data, from data, strict data localization laws to inculcating appropriate safeguards to more liberal approaches with regard to allowing for data to build business. My response with regard to how do we grapple with this data conflict and the need for harmonization to allow for digital trade is that one will very seldomly have all countries have the same data approach. But what we have been looking at within the various regions is have a common principle or common principles that they apply with regard to trade. So uh, this is a very pertinent question because um, in February, we're even hosting a legislative workshop for the Caribbean to deal with enhanced legal frameworks and looking at the elements of data protection. Not because we want everybody in the region to come up with a harmonized framework. It is very unlikely but you want them to have a common understanding and to develop common principles to allow for trade. Um, and if I could just touch on the AFTCFA. That's e-culture, by the way. <laughs> just wanted to say. The AFTCFA uh, question, just very briefly, um, it's a very relevant question and it goes to the whole element of taking common regional approaches and stances because we did a workshop with Comesa on digital trade to allow for everyone to express their opinions on the key areas for digital trade as a lead up to the discussion on the e-commerce protocol that was initiated by the AFCTFA. And it was very interesting what came out of that digital trade workshop. It showed that many of the African countries had very similar problems. Even though some may have been more developed than others, with regard to their digital trade and e-commerce regime, some of the common problems are persistent across the board. And even though the AFTCFA protocol is still in its nascent stages of discussion, it's a very, very good thing that everyone is coming to the table and discussing what is the best common approach towards coming up, not with a completely harmonized agreement, but with common principles that is applicable across the board, I guess I can hand it to you. I was just saying e-culture in a way that is not just about skills in the companies. You're, you're coming back to that same point, um, no matter where you are. Uh, Simon? I actually just wanted to um, speak to the localization question uh, from, I think it was Kyle, right, from the ITC, right? So, I mean, I, I looked at this in quite some detail and um, I, I wrote a paper for the GSMA, um, the, the mobile, Telecoms Operators Association also uh, last year. And, and really we were sort of looking at what the costs of imposing these data localization um, requirements were in, in terms of um, their, their economic cost. And, and so we did some modeling and, and sort of showed, you know, what the, the benefits of, um, you know, cross-border data flows could be in terms of their impact on IoT and, and manufacturing and productivity. Um, what those gains would be is projected over over 20 to 25 years, and then what um, how those gains would be undermined um, with data localization uh, policies that were were you know too invasive. And so, really, I think the 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 issue here is to sort of educate um, policymakers and leaders as to um, what are the costs of imposing data localization measures. I mean, of course, they're gonna they're gonna make those decisions on, on the basis of um, of of 
a whole range of considerations, including industrial policy and including, you know, the fact that many countries have their own ambitions uh, in, in the digital economy. And that's why they, they want to sort of impose data localization because they, they believe falsely, they believe that this uh, encourages the sort of uh, the development of a, of a domestic ecosystem, but, but just sort of in, informing and, and educating policymakers as to what the true costs of these policies are, I think would go a long way to helping them to, to find sort of more nuanced ways of, of achieving the, the stated regulatory objectives um, instead of just sort of arbitrarily blocking the, the free flow of data across borders. So I think that's an important element to it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have one, we're starting to eat into our coffee break, which was eating, drinking, speaking into our coffee break. Uh, but we do have a last round of questions that are coming, including uh, someone who would like to speak directly online. So I leave that to Marie to take us through those questions and the speaker. Thank you. Yes, we have a representative from the private sector that uh, we will allow to talk. And we have a few questions uh, that we receive online. I can uh, read two, and then we'll let the representative speak. So we have a, a question from Francine Belay. She says, what concrete recommendation would you suggest to speed up the digital skills for people to get on board with, the, with digital trade lack of digital payments, stable and affordable internet for all, especially in Africa. Um, and then we have a, um, a question from uh, Griffin Nirongo from Rwanda, I believe. When one talks of digital solution, we need to go beyond utilizing the software to enhance trade and consider support measures to build LDC capacity to manufacture, produce the hardware, the hardware used in application of digital solution. So I'll now um, give the floor to um, Peter Zorn. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Yes, okay. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter Zorn. I am um, I'm an independent advisor, but I'm very closely um, aligned with IBM and have been doing work in global workforce reinvention over the last several years. And I think as we all understand, every job is going to be impacted by new technologies. So whether you are in manufacturing for trade or whether you're in the service side, technology is impacting everyone. And to capitalize on the new digital trade opportunities, as mentioned already, new skills are essential to, to really make progress in this space. Um, I think as Vashti has already pointed out, many organizations are already doing great work in this space on skilling at what I would call a, a micro level, looking in terms of by country, by sector, by channels, by particular parts of the population. The gentleman from EIF mentioned about reskilling 1900 um, women in, in India on a particular program. I believe there is a, a great opportunity to combine forces and resources across many of your organizations and most importantly, partnering with the private sector in terms of building an open ecosystem that encompasses things like learning experience platforms, global architecture frameworks, digital accreditation, and other components. But I think there's three key words that I would use here in terms of what I have seen work across enterprises, as well as individual governments. And one of them is the word transparency, transparency of skills and learning pathways. There is so much opportunity to learn out there today that we really need to help people understand and give them insights into what could they or should they learn that will be of value in their economy. The second word is visibility, the visibility of skills and learnings within a country, knowing what skills you already have, what gaps exist, who is learning what so you can easily find that talent. And the third word is personalization, allowing people to make informed decisions about what to learn, what it would take to become more proficient in that area. I think the aspirations of, of nations to upskill their populations is clear. And from what I, I hear today in this discussion, the question is now how to achieve this. Mm -hmm. 
And as someone who focuses on this sort of reinvention, I would just encourage you together to create a, a, a sort of concrete plan or a, a set of concrete options to address how to execute an ecosystem like this that could be replicated across many markets. This would save resources in terms of both time and money, as well as allow that mobility and flow of resources, especially people, as well as the goods um, across borders, because the learning ecosystem and the skills that would be had would have a certain amount of commonality across borders. That's my, my comment from what I've heard today. Thank you very much. I would like to just very quickly, and then we'll move into the final round here. There's a question from the. Et bonjour, bonjour à tous. Euh, moi, c'est Farah Mahadiop. Je travaille au ministère du Commerce, de la Consommation et des Petites et Moyennes Entreprises du Sénégal. Donc, je me réjouis en tout cas de l'opportunité qui m'est offerte aujourd'hui, en tout cas, de pouvoir prendre part à cette importante euh, activité et dire tout simplement en fait que en traitant en fait du thème euh, maximiser les gains du commerce numérique euh, solutions et priorités pour les pays en développement vous mettez en tout cas euh, en lumière aujourd'hui en fait les défis qui en tout cas nous interpellent nous en tant que PME je viens de sortir d'une activité extrêmement importante organisée par la CUNICET Euh, qui visait à, à faire en tout cas le bilan euh, de l'évaluation en tout cas de, de la mise en œuvre des recommandations euh, qui découlaient de la de l'évaluation des pays à faire du commerce électronique et pour le rappeler en fait cette étude a permis en tout cas au Sénégal d'ouvrir son agenda en ce qui concerne en tout cas le commerce électronique et de cette étude en fait euh, Euh, L'une des recommandations, en tout cas, fortes de cette étude, c'était d'élaborer une stratégie nationale de, de, de développement du commerce électronique. Et c'est le lien ici de remercier, en tout cas, le cadre intégré renforcé qui nous a accompagné non seulement à élaborer une stratégie nationale de développement du commerce électronique, mais également nous a accompagné à mettre en œuvre une plateforme nationale de commerce électronique qui, dans le contexte du COVID, de la COVID-19, nous a permis, en tout cas, d'assurer l'approvisionnement, en tout cas, en matière de biens de première nécessité. Euh, maintenant, pour revenir en tout cas à une préoccupation en tout cas euh, qui a fait l'objet d'un atelier qui s'est déroulé du 27 et 28 octobre hein, organisé par la CUNICET, euh, on a essayé en tout cas à un moment donné de faire le focus sur comment en tout cas euh, mettre en cohérence les initiatives des partenaires en tout cas qui accompagnent nos pays. Et c'est l'idée aujourd'hui de, 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 de en tout cas euh, faire un appel fort aux, aux, aux partenaires qui nous accompagne à redoubler, en tout cas, euh, ou bien à mieux mettre en synergie euh, leurs initiatives, parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, la matrice d'action de l'ITRE aujourd'hui nous a permis d'identifier des projets phares et qui, si nous parvenons à les mettre en œuvre, nous permettra non seulement d'accélérer euh, les recommandations qui ont découlé de cette étude, et nous permettra en tout cas de bâtir un écosystème solide Euh, qui, qui nous permettrait en tout cas de, de tirer profit de ce commerce électronique là. Euh, Thank you. Au Sénégal, nous en tout cas, le, 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 en termes de mise en œuvre, nous sommes parvenus à mettre 81% des recommandations de, de l'IT Ready à côté du, du Togo bien sûr. Et pour les 19% qui restent, nous en tout cas attendons de nos partenaires qui nous accompagnent en tout cas à les, à, à les accélérer. Merci. Je vous remercie. Thank you. What skills, what to prioritize, especially in Africa? We've heard about coherence just now, how to, and also from our intervention online, um, what can we do to uh, skill up and scale up quickly, open partnerships uh, with the private sector around transparency, visibility, and personalization were the three key words we heard. Um, and I think that was really the key. They were really questions around the same kind of topics. Who would like to take the floor? Can I, yeah. can I do it in, I mean, actually less than a minute. So what I can do is, you know, I can support what uh, many of them uh, said, uh, including Griffin and, and, and Peter. Uh, just one um, point on uh, 
what Peter has proposed in terms of learning opportunities. Uh, all three points are very, very important, transparency, visibility, and personalization. What is even more important is the application of the knowledge. The skill is there, but how to apply the knowledge in practice is something that needs to be thought through together, working together with the private sector. Because a lot of time what happens in a number of countries, including Nepal and Bhutan, when the E-Trade Readiness Assessment was being done, that there are several graduates who are coming out of the university and institution of higher learnings, but their skill does not match the skill profile that is required by their potential employer. So that could be a challenge. So that needs to be addressed. Um, and and uh, in relation to just a quick point on uh, the, uh, the the point made by a representative from Senegal. Yes, of course, we are pleased to support uh, the um, national uh, development of NASA strategy and the development of platform in Senegal, which came straight from the recommendation of E-Trade Readiness Assessment. So this shows the example of good partnership between various organizations working together to promote digital um, digital capability uh, in, in LDCs. So I stop there. Yeah, I mean, um, what what Peter uh, Zorn is, is talking about sort of ties in quite nicely with with the question that Francine uh, Belli was was asking. Um, in you know, what concrete recommendations would you set, suggest to speed up the digital skills for people to get on board with digital trade? Um, and I think I think it really goes back to um, uh, just making making data cheaper and making it easier for people to get online. In developing countries, you know, I've seen this in the region where I do a lot of work, which is Asia and the Pacific, uh, and um, and and really, um, the cost of people for people to get online is so prohibitive that they just can't go on uh, on the internet and sort of learn these skills because because as Peter pointed out, I mean, there's so much information available. There's there's platforms like Coursera uh, and and you know even AWS and Microsoft and Google they offer their their own um, largely sort of free certification and training programs. Um, and, and really the, the ability to benefit from this is the ability, is the ability to get online and do it sort of affordably. Um, and so it, it comes down to that sort of access issue. I really can't stress that enough, um, just how important it is to have access to sort of ubiquitous and affordable um, data. You know, maybe maybe I'm a bit biased because I, I sort of come from from this this background of a of a big technology company such as Huawei, sort of building networks and operating networks was kind of their thing. But but really, that that's kind of what I've seen from my own experience is the big kind of bottleneck is is access to affordable uh, data and, and getting online easily. Thank you, Basti. Final words. Uh, going back to one of the key areas that I mentioned in the first sentence. Building digital skills is a critical component of your national e-commerce strategy. In fact, you can build out the most elaborate blockchain technology-based platform. It requires system architects. It involves system engineers who are able to keep the lights on, but also for your end users to be able to access it. So in terms of skill development, it requires different levels that must be built into your national e-commerce approach from technical vocational educational studies, the primary, secondary, and university level, but also in terms of the technical skills that are required to make sure that developing states not just use technology, but don't end up having to import these skills to be able to continuously maintain and update it, but to in their own way own it and utilize it effectively. So I think my time is up. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone here in the panel and to everyone in the audience and online for your questions, which were super interesting. And I will no longer stand between coffee and tea, whether you are online or in the room. Uh, there's coffee and tea outside for the people who are here. And we will convene again at 435 to look at how do we put these things into practice with the lessons learned.
Good afternoon, everyone. We're starting up again in just about one minute. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our session, second session on digital trade for LDCs. What are the priorities? How do we get there? How can we help the small firms who need it the most? And in this second session, we're looking at lessons learned and how to put things together in terms of priorities for the aid for trade context. We have speakers with us from UNCTED, the Enhanced Integrated Framework from WTO Aid for Trade. And and a special guest speaker, the ambassador uh, of the Gambia in Geneva, Professor Mohamedou uh, Ka. His Excellency, we would like to give the floor to you first, and then we will turn over to the colleagues here on the panel with me. His Excellency is speaking to us online. Floor is yours. If we have a moment while we're setting up, I'll just tell you a little bit why he is such a special guest. Uh, he has a long career spanning more than three decades in higher education, science and technologies, and not just a diplomatic career. He has worked as a founding chairman of Zenith, Zenith Bank in the Gambia. He's worked as a chairman of the board of directors for Africa Consulting and Trading Group in Senegal. He's um, started, uh, he's done a startup in the Gambia in technologies, and he is um, a professor and a high level, um, he's, he's held many high level positions in uh, universities in the Gambia, um, in Nigeria, and even in Azerbaijan. So he's really got a very well prepared and interesting background. I'm sure we're all excited to hear from him. Floor is yours. Okay, I understand there's a technical difficulty, so we'll turn first to the presenters, in which case 
I will turn first to Michael Roberts. Uh, I presume everyone knows Michael. He is the head of the Aid for Trade unit uh, at WTO. He is the one who's been putting these, these themes behind and making things happen and getting the word out. And he's got a lot of insights for us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. And uh, perhaps let me pick up on Simon's presentation. As he was saying, the band is back together. And thank you, Simon, for the new album. So um, the, uh, while the uh, presentation is, uh, is just going up, um, I'll try and keep it as, uh, as, as short as, as possible. Um, the, this presentation, the, um, what I'm going to be talking about is the results of the monitoring and evaluation exercise that uh, we conducted in preparation for the global review and try and amplify some of the messages that have already um, taken, uh, we've already heard this afternoon. So um, in the interest of time, let's skip on. So you don't need to look at uh, this first one. That gives you an idea of the, the responses that we had. Um, let's uh, go straight into the uh, second slide which already starts to talk about some of the results that uh, came out. And this is something that both, both uh, Vashti and, um, and Simon had mentioned, um, which is that there was a surge in demand for connectivity as a result of COVID. So COVID really pressed fast forward in terms of um, the um, digital connectivity, people getting online and that the biggest jump in connectivity was um, was uh, seen amongst developing countries. So there um, so not only did you have that demand perspective, uh, you had a surge in demand which ended up in a lot more people going online. Um, it also highlighted a lot of those these, those issues in terms of connectivity, that uh, both uh, both the previous speakers uh, spoke to, spoke about, and so here, unfortunately, you got that little bit um, the, the the little black square there is over that top one. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you can see there that um, the in terms of the um, infrastructure um, infrastructure remains a key binding constraint. Thank you um, for um, particularly LDCs. Um, but it's not the not the only um, element to the digital divide, and poor skills and IT literacy comes out as uh, as 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 one of the um, one of the also one of the top concerns there. Going to um, again points that have already been covered. Affordability is a major issue, um, and so there. Uh, Simon was talking about the cost of you know the of the of the the cost of connection. That's really um, something that I think out of all of these surveys, it keeps on coming out more and more. The, the coverage is there, um, well, it's growing, um, but the usage is way below coverage. So there, um, what are the solutions that we can potentially think of in terms of um, trade policy and other, uh, and other policy areas to try and get that cost down? Um, I was going to talk about um, Madagascar, but uh, perhaps again, just in the interest of time, let me skip that. Um, one something that I think um, is perhaps um, interesting, and maybe it's just sort of anecdotal about the pickup in terms of um, uh, digital connectivity and its usage. Usage. So I had the fortune of, of visiting Tonga um, before the COVID nineteen. Um, and they're able to browse, look at, you know, uh, join, you know, um, browse the internet, look at my emails, everything, totally normal. And then I saw when I came back about a year later that a, that a ship had dragged its anchor and pulled the, and basically cut off Tonga because it had uh, ripped through the undersea cable. And then the next thing you hear is people are jumping on planes to go down to New Zealand. Why? They're small business owners. They're the service providers are absolutely dependent on that physical, uh, that physical link. So it gives you, I think, an idea of the interconnectedness um, of and the reliance that, uh, that you have in, the, in this area that rapidly develops. So can we move on to the next slide? 
Something that I'd like to highlight as a driver. So we think COVID is a driver. Um, well, why is it a driver? And one of the reasons why it was a driver is because a lot of government services went online. So here there's a um, the role of the e-government can play in its many in its uh, in its many facets. I think is is perhaps something that hasn't been given sufficient attention. It comes out very strongly from the um, from the research work that we that we did. And my apologies to the interpreters. I hopefully I'm not speaking too fast. Um, so there, um, e government in terms of if I need a new passport. Obviously, when COVID was there, the lockdowns were in place. I need a new passport. I need. Um, another form of official documentation, a lot of those services went online, they went online in developed countries, they also went online in developing countries as well. So that has had a huge impact. Also down at the level of um, digitization of processes for trade. So they're at the border, so digitization of customs clearance. And again, that was given a, a real push during uh, during the COVID times. It's also clear though, and we started to touch on this um, with the previous presentations, that this is a complex area in, in, in a policy sense. So we had references to M-Pesa, to e-payments. So as a Ministry of Trade, there you're dealing with the central bank suddenly. Uh, that's maybe not something that you would necessarily be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You're thinking about issues of privacy, security, you're thinking about trade facilitation dimensions as well. It really um, raises a whole range of different policy concerns. And then if you allow me to go back to look at the research work that we did back in 2017, one of the, one of the, when we looked at um, whether uh, the ministries of trade knew about national connectivity strategy, we found that there was um, a digital divide in terms of the ministries themselves even being aware that there were national connectivity plans. There were national connectivity plans. Why? Because of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union processes that have those national strategies. It was just that the Ministry of Trade wasn't aware of them. Why were they not aware of them? Well, because they weren't invited to the meetings. So that's something that seems to have changed now. There seems to be this greater um, understanding of the uh, interrelationship with, with trade. But, and here's a, an important point, if um, that demand is not being expressed in terms of that demand for aid for trade resources in the digital area, then it's not going to end up in additional finance because obviously the demand can just be, well, I mean, I have a demand for a new suit, until I go to out to buy it, then obviously that market signal is not is not is not there. So having the um, a need is not it has it has to be expressed. That's what I'm trying to say. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, Simon made this uh, very nice point about how the digital and the analog uh, economy is emerging. If you speak to Ho Lim in a uh, trade environment, he'll tell you how the, the green economy is going to emerge with the rest of the economy. So it's not only at this, uh, at the digital analog uh, interface that you're going to start to see this, you're also going to see that in terms of um, the, this focus around sustainability. This is a very busy slide. The one point to take away from it is that there's tremendous scope to be using digital connectivity, digital um, uh, measures, um, digital applications for green outcomes. Just think about um, the example of early warnings for um, natural disasters, now storms, hurricanes, cyclones coming through. How are you gonna receive that? You're gonna receive the warnings on your phone. So um, mm -hmm. there's again, this integration between um, the two things. Can we go move to the next slide? Um, the lack of skills that um, the speakers were talking about, um, obviously that's gendered as well in terms of uh, where that lack of skills lies. And obviously here 
Um, no surprise, well, uh, women respondents report facing additional difficulties. So there, that needs to be taken into account in terms of the programming of, uh, of support. Onwards and upwards to the next slide. Now, um, I guess what one of the main points that Simon in his paper was trying to get to was we need more resources to be uh, to be going into the um, into the uh, more resources coming from the aid for trade envelope going towards digital connectivity towards digitization. So, um, and he mentioned the, a figure of about two percent of overall. Uh, no, it was actually uh, Ranika that mentioned this figure of about two percent of overall spending that's going in. There. Um, now, I've already mentioned that if you're not expressing that demand, then that figure is going to remain low. Um, is that perhaps a bit of a, 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 you know, a get out on my side? Well, maybe a little bit. Um, obviously, the programming is done normally at a national level. So it's donors who are there with the national uh, counterparts through the EIF, through other mechanisms who are there agreeing the priorities versus the supply of assistance, agreeing on what will be, how that money will be uh, directed and prioritized. <clears throat> so yes, there is this issue of prioritization there. Um, the other, I think, point, and this will speak to what I'm going to get to in the next slide, is that remember that connectivity, digital connectivity, digital applications, they are investable. So um, there, one question here is how much should um, traditional donors be getting involved in this area um, without crowding out the private sector? So making sure that they create the incentives. Um, yesterday, there was a, a very um, a, uh, extensive discussion around the DG's ideas are looking at um, moving from an aid for trade to an invest for trade model. If we can move to the next slide. I think you get an idea of what that would mean when you move from aid for trade, which is just purely uh, grants and concessional financing, typically on um, through IDA, to a broader um, uh, frame, a broader lens that would look at development finance more generally. So here, when you do that, you realize that actually the, um, the majority of finance is not going in the form of concessional finance and grants. It's going in this, in this broader category of what might be termed development finance. And there, the numbers start to look much larger. There's been this tripling in the, um, in the amount of financing the, between 2015 and 2019. That's OECD figures. And leading that charge has been the multilateral development banks. And you can see there that the, in particular, the World Bank is, is a major player and the IFC as well is a major player in, in, in this respect. Um, you can also see the development, uh, sorry, bilateral financing has increased and also what we're terming philanthropic. Who do I mean by philanthropic? Well, I mean, people like the Gates Foundation, Mastercard Foundation, et cetera. So, there's um, a nice, uh, a good discussion to be having, to be had with um, all of those uh, actors as well. So final slide, um, conclusions to take away. Well, COVID-19 is this booster for, for digital connectivity, but remember the e-government aspect to that um, and understanding how e-government and the digitization of government processes can act as a sort of a pump, pump primer or um, digital connectivity. Um, trade policy obviously plays an important role in this area. And um, we'd be happy to continue the discussion on um, how to uh, scale up uh, resources in the development, it, it, not just looking at it, the framing the, the resources in an A for trade sense, but maybe also in a broader development finance invest for trade approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, you've echoed a lot of the points that were in the first session when you were talking about access, cost, infrastructure, and skills, but there are some interesting things that you've um, 
highlighted here that are new. And I think one of them is, I think it was really, how do we get practical in terms of the financing? And so one of the things that you've said is think about connecting those different worlds, which also comes back to thinking about digital culture in a, in a different way, in a holistic way. So it could be connecting trade and e-commerce worlds, which might be different paths, different funders, different networks. It could actually, as you've mentioned, digital and green, it could be trade and environmental, which is also something, there are worlds that don't always meet uh, and it could go broader. And the other thing that I thought was interesting in the follow the money story is um, we've been talking about leveraging and you said, really pay attention to those banks. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I heard coming out from that. Um, with that, I uh, think it is time to turn to our partner at EIF, and that's Annette, who is Sesmuwemba. I'm sorry. Um, Annette, I, oh, she's so famous in Geneva. I always think of her as Annette. Um, she's the deputy executive director um, at the EIF, and she has also worked at Trademark East Africa before uh, EIF, and she's going to tell you about some of the lessons learned from uh, this world. Oh, would you like um, the ambassador to speak now? Sorry, everyone. Annette, you have to wait. Yeah. The ambassador no, is no, online. No, no, he, the technical let, let, let her go. Let, resolved. And sorry, let her go on. Let her go on while I get myself organized. Let her go on. I'll speak next. Do you want us? Do you want Annette to go forward? We don't. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please. Yeah. Okay. Over to you, Annette. Um, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And um, I also want to recognize uh, Simon Vashti and uh, Michael's earlier uh, submissions and presentations. I think my contribution to the discussion today is to um, bring the practical perspective, what we have done and what we have learned um, over the, the years. And, and Michael has elaborated on the um, positive spin-off from COVID, which is that um, uh, digital trade suddenly uh, took a leap forward. And we've seen LDCs very actively moving forward with investments in uh, harnessing digital trade. And we see this both um, in the demand for digital trade projects, such as building e-commerce platforms in Cambodia and, and Senegal, as well as integrating digital trade elements into productive capacity projects. And we do have quite a number of requests and submissions around how we could support um, um, digital trade. Um, so far, we have about 79 e-commerce initiatives, and it seems like a lot, but as reflecting and listening to Simon and to the earlier presentations as well, I, don't, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. We're only scratching uh, the surface. Uh, but within this experience, I'll share five key lessons. Um, and the first one is partnerships and national ownership. We've heard a lot about that. It was one of the recommendations that we had from Simon. Uh, leveraging a hunger to learn. There's a hunger to learn, to be involved, not to be left behind. Um, a really important lesson that we have seen. Coordination and sharing knowledge. Building in sustainability, linking into productive capacity and focusing on the power of women entrepreneurs and the youth. And um, again, I, probably this links into the question we had earlier on, uh, on equity. Now on partnerships, I think we've learned that partnerships built around country owned agendas are key. That the agenda must be owned by the country and build a partnership around that. Um, this is very important. And I think it's a point uh, Vashti as well um, emphasized uh, in her presentation, country ownership can drive catalytic investments because it demonstrates that um, interventions will deliver results and enables countries to invest their own resources into that particular initiative. Um, in Ratnaka's comments earlier, he gave the example of where our investment of 40,000 um, US dollars in improving the postal and customs services in Cambodia resulted into 1.2 million from the private sector, and that is Swiss contact in scaling up. But also in Burundi, we've had examples where governments being involved and uh, this agenda rotating up around uh, their national 
interests. There's been a whole reformulation of um, policies to incorporate the gender economy. Um, the Ministry of ICT is now introducing a legal framework for promoting ICT in the education of women and girls. These are typical examples of involving the government, working with the government, and how that leads to change. A um, couple of weeks ago, we were in the Gambia. Again, we uh, visited a program that is being supported by the Ministry of Trade, led by the Ministry of Trade, but working with the local resource people. The involvement of this um, team that is very um, drawn from uh, national experts contributed to increase in the trust and involvement of project beneficiaries. And that delivered very, very good results. Again, from a partnership uh, point of view. Some of the key outcomes from that project, and it, it was launched around COVID time, which again, talks to the point that Michael spoke about. Uh, the overall, if I can give a brief background so you understand the context, was to create a platform that allowed women in the Gambia to be able to access markets um, for onions and other horticultural produce beyond their own localities. Given all the travel restrictions during the COVID time, it was impossible to move from one region to another. So this platform was created. Um, this platform has been localized so that the um, information is in the local languages. The materials that are being used are in the local languages and it allows for trust to be built. It keeps the interest of the women involved. Partnership again, as a key point um, that I emphasize. On the point um, around the hunger to learn, all the programs that we are supporting and implementing have a huge number of women and the youth involved. Um, we started off with uh, catalytic investments around a few um, target beneficiaries, but the overwhelming um, interest that we have for many more to be involved, women, the youth is overwhelming and we simply don't have all the resources we wish that we did. Uh, but it, for us, it's a really key lesson that investments, financial resources need to be put into these areas so that uh, women can be more involved, so that the youth uh, can be more involved. Um, we've, however, observed that um, in all the capacity building um, interventions, it's also important to build in the seamless user experience uh, so that uh, the digital assets are intuitive and not intimidating to the users. And again, in all the programs and projects that we have implemented, for example, with our ITU to build digital skills for um, women and girls in Haiti, in Ethiopia, and in, in Burundi, we've incorporated these elements so that we can keep the audience engaged. We can keep um, the beneficiaries engaged. Um, it's very, very uh, disappointing. And, and um, I think losing all the gains from involving and getting out women and girls involved, only for them to drop off simply because it's very intimidating to continue to use uh, these platforms. Um, the other lesson on coordination and sharing of knowledge and lessons, you will all be aware of structures that we have established in the countries um, referred to as the national implementation units. These are structures that help to ensure that there's a focus on trade in, in, in the respective countries. These platforms have been very, very beneficial in serving as a coordination platform. And uh, for all the work that we have undertaken, I haven't spoken about ITRED readiness assessments because I know um, uh, Toban is going to speak about them. Coordination through these platforms has been very beneficial in rolling out additional activities in scaling up. Uh, for example, in uh, Cambodia, in Tuvalu, in Bhutan, in Nepal, all the work on coordinating e-trade readiness assessments has been through these um, um, institutional frameworks that have been established. And um, we work very closely with ITC as well on sheet trades programs. All the implementation through sheet trades happens using the coordination frameworks that have been um, established. It helps in terms of sharing knowledge. It supports in uh, ensuring that lessons are um, uh, disseminated replication
speaking with the beneficiaries in many of the countries where we work, a key um, uh, positive outcome that they um, explain is the possibility for them to engage with beneficiaries from other countries to be able to learn. And this is through those coordination mechanisms uh, that this has been um, possible. Uh, the other lesson I'll speak about is uh, embedding sustainability in project design and incorporating access to finance options. I think we've heard about the finance question and why that is very, very important. Um, starting a digital initiative and not having a sustainable approach for it to be able to continue is um, loss of um, huge investment and time. And uh, linking to this again is the productive capacity issue. It won't be beneficial to create many platforms and uh, build capacity for no capacity to be available in terms of products to be sold uh, on those platforms. We need to continue making sure women through the different productive capacity interventions that are in place can continue to develop their skills and have more offers to place through those uh, platforms. Uh, we all know how quickly uh, and how dynamic technology is, but also how consumer preferences change. Uh, they change so quickly that if we don't have the same pace to keep up to ensure that the platforms can be serviced with a, a produce from um, the various um, uh, entrepreneurs, then we won't be able to see to reap good um, benefits and outcomes uh, for, for participants. Uh, this is very, very important for us. In all the projects that we implement, we build in this um, element to ensure that there'll be a, con a continuous a skills building program to be able to have um, new products, new commodities, to be able to change uh, platforms, incorporate technology as, um, as it evolves. And again, back to the point that I raised earlier of having national institutions involved, it means that governments own these agendas and work with the beneficiaries um, through cooperatives, through the private sector to ensure that um, uh, this remains. And finally, on the issue of uh, women and youth um, that I spoke about earlier, it's really important to continue those investments. Uh, we know the cultural barriers that our women um, uh, face and how um, digital trade e-commerce have proved one of the ways that they've been over, able to overcome or circumvent um, some of these um, uh, issues and, and barriers. Keeping them involved, making sure that uh, we have many more involved and engaged. And we know the statistics around how many women have been plunged into extreme poverty, how many have lost their jobs as a result of COVID. For us, it's really, really important that they keep engaged and involved and that we open up uh, these avenues for them. And it's for this reason that we also have the Empower Women Power Trade Initiative, for which there's a very specific uh, uh, digital angle, working with um, ITU, working with uh, UNCTAD on um, um, gender policies, uh, working with other uh, partners like um, the East African Women in Business uh, platform who are on the share sector. All of these are meant to ensure that uh, women are involved and, and, and have access to these opportunities. Um, the youth, of course, very entrepreneurial, very creative, always looking for opportunities. It's very, very important that uh, we keep them involved and engaged. Um, so Natalie, I hope um, that gives you a flavor of some of the lessons we've learned over time through um, the various projects we've implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, there's so much to, to unpack actually from what you've said. And I hope it gives people food for thought from these things of a little can go a long way if you do it properly in terms of leveraging partnerships, in terms of the hunger for skill building, in terms of the importance of putting the accent on women and youth in terms of our priorities. And country ownership is something that is a lot easier said than done. Uh, maybe when you're working from the outside and you're, you're coordinating so many different actors and the talk of coordination platforms this is hard work. It's behind the scenes work. Uh, I think if you're in the room and you've heard this and you quote this, uh, talking about local language, 
uh, to build trust and culture is something that you should ask about because, of course, that makes a real difference, especially if you want to get beyond a capital and you want to build that kind of e-culture that, that we're talking about here. And financial sustainability, not to build lots of new things in the landscape, maybe build on what you have and think about the long term and the handover. Also really, really critical. Um, with that and more on country ownership, I'm sure we're going to be hearing from uh, Torbjorn Fredriksson from uh, UNCTAD, who is heading the e-commerce and digital economy branch at the UN. Many of you may know the um, annual e-commerce week that takes place each spring um, and a number of their reports, such as the digital economy report, um, their e-commerce readiness assessments. Um, our organization has worked with UNCTAD, will continue to do so as we do with everyone here at this table. Over to you. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, many thanks to the organizers for allowing Ankta to participate in this important event. Uh, I think uh, you will uh, feel that I will not be dissenting a lot from what has already been said, but hopefully reinforcing some of the messages. Uh, let me start by agreeing that there is uh, a clear need to scale up resources for the development capabilities needed to harness digital opportunities for trade and development. Yes, we saw that the, the amounts that have been going to digitalization uh, from, uh, from various development partners has increased between 2015 and 2019. But in fact, going from 2019 to 2020, it stayed pretty flat. Uh, there was a, a, some increase in terms of the absolute uh, amounts, but in terms of the share of uh, investment from aid to trade resources was pretty flat. And it's, it's still, in terms of relative uh, measures, has not reached the levels that we saw around 2005, you know, around the World Summit on the Information Society and so on. Uh, and of course, again, the pandemic has been uh, a catalyzer of attention to digitalization, but it has also really revealed how big the divides are between countries in this area. Uh, and uh, this has sort of accentuated the need to take action to try to uh, address the, the weaknesses that exist. Uh, for example, in the area of digital trade specifically, countries with relatively low levels of digital readiness they have been less successful in taking the opportunities that it offers, uh, both with regard to e-commerce and what we call digitally delivered services, which are basically the two dimensions of digital trade, uh, resulting in widening inequalities in this area. And, and the growing, we have heard the references to that as well, the growing reliance on data and digital platforms makes it even more urgent to consider how best to strengthen the capabilities of developing countries, and especially the least developed countries, to seize opportunities and address challenges associated with digitalization. And following up on the question on data localization, there's no doubt that we need a much bigger, much more global, much more comprehensive debate in the world on how to deal with data, uh, because it's so much more than just a question of data localization or data protection. And we, this is something that we are discussing uh, also in the context of UNCTAD. And so at UNCTAD, as was mentioned, I'm leading our work on e-commerce and the digital economy. Uh, this program has grown significantly, significantly in the past years, partly because of member states' prioritization within UNCTAD's work, but also thanks to significant donor contributions. And uh, we have our four core donors being Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, and Sweden. One of the tools that we use in this program uh, are the e-trade readiness assessments that Annette was uh, mentioning here. We have so far published 24 such assess assessments for least developed countries and another eight for non-LDCs and some regions also. We have also supported national e-commerce strategy development for four LDCs and for three non-LDCs. And uh, I'm very happy to acknowledge that the IF has uh, supported some of this work. Uh, the assessments that we have done at the country level have also helped to spur work at the regional level. So, for example, in, in ECOWAS, the East African community, and now also in the Pacific. So I think uh, even if the one wants to emphasize the regional dimension, it needs to be anchored in a solid knowledge of what's happening at the country level so that countries can go to the regional level or to the continental le level in Africa or at the global level with a solid knowledge base of their own situation. Um, as uh, was mentioned by Mr. Diop from Senegal, thank you for recognizing uh, this. We had last week uh, a very interesting meeting here in Geneva 
um, uh, that several of you attending here in the room or uh, online attended. We had more than 20 LDCs and other developing countries joining from capital in person here in Geneva. So it was like the first time after COVID that we could bring everyone together again. And no, among non-LDCs, we had a representation from Cote d'Ivoire, from Jordan, Kenya, Mongolia, and Tunisia. At that meeting, several donor representatives and partners also attended, including our close uh, friends from in this room. Uh, the overall objective was to explore how we together can further improve support for the implementation of the recommendations that are contained in the various country assessments that we are providing. And some of the key takeaways here, uh, number one, bringing together a network of what we call focal points from the different countries uh, is very important for sharing knowledge and good practices. So everyone recognized that they can learn from each other. There is a need also for stronger institutional setups for interministerial coordination and uh, follow-up, as well as for multi-stakeholder dialogue. We had the ambassador of Cambodia, for instance, mentioning that in the Cambodian strategy to follow up in this area related to e-commerce, 18 government ministries and agencies were involved. That's a tall order to, to organize that. Uh, we also recognize that there are important synergies between the E-Trade for Women initiative. So again, linking up to the gender dimension here uh, with a view to empower women di digital entrepreneurs. There is still a need to raise awareness among donors and development partners about digital trade and why that needs to be an important part of development strategies. We had the representative from the UN resident uh, uh, coordinator office in Mongolia, Ms. Tapan Mishra, and we had a close discussion on what role can the new uh, UN RCOs play here to facilitate better coordination so that we avoid duplication of work at the national level. Um, and in that context, we also discussed the role of the, the national implementation units of the EIF that were recognized as very having played a very important part. Some also referred to the national uh, trade facilitation committees that could also contribute in this process. So the key is to not invent the wheel, look for existing uh, uh, structures that can be built on. And there was also a big call for better statistics. Uh, we talked about how do we raise awareness among the Minister of Finance or the Prime Ministers if we cannot prove that the results are there. So if we, there are no statistics on the what's happening in digital trade or in e-commerce in the country, it's very difficult to prove it. Now, in view of the limited availability of development assistance funding for the digital area, it becomes even more important to look for smart ways of partnership and collaboration. This is needed to avoid, again, duplication of work, find synergies, and to be cost effective. It was against that background that we created this E-Trade for All initiative. In 2016, we'd had 14 organizations coming together at the Ankland Ministerial Meeting in Nairobi, seeking to support such efforts. And th those included the EIF, WTO, um, the Commonwealth, no, the Commonwealth came later, actually, uh, ITU and the World Bank uh, and ITC. It now comprises 35 regional and global organizations that all in some way seek to help developing countries in seven policy areas of relevance to e-commerce and the digital economy. Some recent new members include the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, the British Standards Institution, and the UN Capital Development Fund. And earlier this year, the International Chamber of Commerce became the, uh, the main focal point with the private sector in this area. And for those of you who read uh, Simon's uh, interesting paper, uh, he makes reference to this, these seven areas which the Friends of E-Commerce for Development uh, sort of built a consensus around in 2017. And these were exactly the same areas that the E-Trade for All initiative had, had agreed upon. And these are also the seven areas that are covered in the E-Trade readiness assessment. So it's, it's about connecting the dots here. Now, going forward, there is no doubt scope for strengthening coordination in this area, and given the growing demand that we see and that I think all of us are seeing for assistance, it will be important to implement scale-up support through joint efforts wherever possible. This would be an efficient use of taxpayers' money and also reduce the burden on the beneficiary countries that have to manage too many offers from too many players that sometimes are very similar in nature. So while I very much welcome renewed efforts to expand development assistance in the digital area, we need to avoid reinventing the wheel and we need to leverage existing initiatives. 
uh, including the E-Trade for All initiative, the Broadband Commission's activities, and many others, with a view to enhancing the efficiency of the overall system, providing enabling dig digital trade in developing countries. So with that, thanks again, and happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Tor Torbjorn. Um, I thought that was very interesting to just focus, focus, focus on how we have to work uh, together and uh, not overlap. Uh, we'll come back to your presentation. We have the ambassador from the Gambia online. We think he was online. Is he online now? Yes, I am. Uh, good, uh, is it good afternoon? <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. C'est le soir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Floor is yours uh, and we you see so you. Okay, you see me. So thank you so much for having me. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me on this uh, very important um, area on on digital trade and uh, solutions and priorities for developing countries and LDCs. Um, I join myself uh, to uh, thank EIF uh, for spearheading this and calling us to exchange some ideas and some views. And I associate myself with the earlier interventions that I was opportune to listen to. Uh, undoubtedly, the relevance of digital trade uh, is expanding and businesses in both goods and service delivery uh, via various types of digital platforms are maximizing the benefit of E-Trade. And the growth of digital trade undoubtedly will open uh, tremendous opportunities uh, uh, for services online to promote export diversification, uh, enhance efficiencies, and growth for the emerging manufacturing uh, ecosystems in our countries, helping uh, actors and agents in SMEs remove intermediations, improve their competitiveness, and access in the access uh, uh, to financial services that um, are increasingly being available on digital trade platforms, and also, more importantly, increase. SMEs and MSMEs access to relevant market information and also market access uh, that they were not opportune uh, to have. But the reality is, um, if I may uh, be a little bit provocative and say, are there, are there gains for digital trade in LDCs and in developing countries? Did, did, did developing countries or LDCs or have they begin to be opportune to harness the advancements and the value that digital trade is providing? Digital trade seem to be maturing in many parts of the world, but it's becoming more of an idea an aspiration. And the question is, how do we move from talking about it to actually jumpstarting and building a functional digital trade ecosystems for LDCs? And that will require collaborations and partnerships to build it and also be cognizant of the challenges and the difficulties of having truly a robust, trusted digital trade ecosystem and infrastructure in our countries. The potential of digital trade, we all know, is constrained by lack of access to finance, to capital, uh, low incomes. Also, LDCs have been unfortunately constrained by the lack of connecting the many unconnected who are actually in the informal sector across our countries, especially if you move from urban to, to, to rural. The importance of connecting the unconnected, the importance of access, the importance of affordability, adaptability, adequacy, secure and resilient broadband connectivity, as well as the non-digital requirements for digital trade to be valuable, such as 
adequacy of transport infrastructure, competencies and scaling up gaps that exist in LDCs. For us to truly maximize the gains, these are things that must be addressed immediately. The legal and regulatory frameworks are insufficient to protect against cybercrime, for example, which can easily compromise and race into trust and efficacy issues of a valuable digital trade platforms in LDCs. Ensuring privacy, as well as support for interoperability of, for example, emerging services and technologies such as mobile money platforms and banks, and also to promote consumer trust in online transactions that may be taken for granted in other developed parts of the world. And still there are trust issues of doing business online and fulfilling a transaction. Also, there is a lot of intellectual properties that are in, uh, an intellectual and intangible assets that are embedded among SMEs and MSMEs that need to be protected. So how do we protect digital sites from liability for customers that are putting their uh, intellectual assets and goods and services? So underscoring that digital trade is a key factor to revitalize and optimize and scale, as well as provide access to market and help reduce transaction costs, as I mentioned, remove intermediation, as well as help at the attainment of socioeconomic development across LDCs. Digital trade can facilitate the promotion of value creating entrepreneurship and also contribute to developing the SMEs and SMEs to create jobs as well as play a critical role in connecting intra-country value chains, urban and rural value chains and markets, regional value chains, as well as connecting actors and agents in business, in SMEs to global value chains. Furthermore, I want to say that for LDCs, digital trade has huge potential as the young population in LDCs have been expanding and they are engaged continuously in the creative side by producing and consuming. So with the challenges that LDC face in pursuing digital trade infrastructure, there are also challenges in pursuing digital trade policies, as well as the weak data and digital infrastructure compared to countries where digital trade is thriving. So in order for LDCs to advance digital trade, regulatory systems need to be developed further, not only at the national, but equally at the regional level. In Africa, for example, the EFCFTA will play or must play a critical role, and so do the international institutions such as UNECA and also EIF as they reprogram their country programs. Some practical policy solutions that can be undertaken include summary, digitalization at the core of national digital trade initiatives, digital trade growth and transformation strategies, two, smarter regulations for digital innovation. We've seen in most of LDCs now, they've begun to re-architecture governments and begin to introduce in the government architecture ministries of communication and digital economy. That provides enormous opportunity for coordination, alignment and collaboration between ministries of trade, ministries of finance and all other internal stakeholders with actors and agents in the multilateral system such as WTO to ensure that digital trade take root meaningfully. Education for digital innovation is critical for digital trade platforms and services to benefit from the creativity of youth and women to be on the production side as opposed to just on the consuming side and be able to, to develop and deploy and design homegrown digital trade platforms and services as opposed to 
digital trade platforms and services that are designed and produced and pushed to LDCs running the risk of not being broadly used. So skill development beyond digital skilling and digital literacy must take root for value creating digital trade. It is important also actors and agents in the research community and the startup community to be brought in to build the ecosystem, a functional digital trade ecosystem that is anchored on research and development. Also introducing sustainable and innovative fiscal incentives for digital trade is essential and crucial. Again, with the digital divide and the, 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 the need to connect the unconnected where the actors and agents for trade reside requires supporting the last mile infrastructure where WTO, uh, EIF must uh, uh, talk to actors and agents in that space such as the ITU among others. Tra digital trade innovation hubs must begin to mushroom in LDCs and also toward trusted digitalization and digital platforms and services because trust is essential for transactions that are, that are required. Um, functional, and as I said, functional and sustainability, sustainability of digital trade ecosystems with smart trade policies and regulations, as well as smart digital trade, non-punitive tax regimes must be encouraged in LDCs for adoption, for diffusion, for growth, and for use as well as to provide incentives for SMEs and SMEs and young people and women who are the crucial drivers for a thriving digital trade that will mature and be interfaced to global value chains. Lastly, if I may, it is also important to take note of the emerging technologies that are out there that brings enormous opportunities uh, for, digital trans for digital transformation. So often these are considered uh, luxuries as opposed to uh, digital technologies that will improve inclusive great growth, improving the availability of data, solving the issue of uneven digital connectivity and establishing smarter regulatory framework and digital development and data flows that are important. And these technologies, I'll just cite one, and I will, I, will, I will end there. Focus on um, building capacity and competencies for our countries around artificial intelligence for trade, machine learning for trade, and more importantly, blockchains. Blockchains are kind of electronic bookkeeping that will enable a list of encrypted transactions, which is known as ledger, to be stored in a decentralized manner. This can help uh, the main players in trade in LDCs, which are women, to overcome the barriers of trade that they continue to face. So putting, putting a focus to help these countries as we build digital trade to harness the importance of these intelligent and emerging technologies, such as AI, such as blockchain technology, can significantly lower the cost of cross-border payments, Security, securitized trading and compliance, while it is anonymized and efficient that could enable the women who are often uh, uh, disadvantaged on trade, would, who are constrained by the law and customs or high cost to engage in financial and business transactions. So in my mind, thinking ahead, blockchain could be one of the ingredients as well as AI and building a data infrastructure that can help LDCs leapfrog and, and use these technologies where, for example, women who lack identification documents that they can undertake transactions that they could not ordinarily do without official identifications. So there are lots of emerging technologies such as these that can prove valuable as opposed to just talking about building these digital platforms and services. So um, I, will, I will end there and just to thank you that it is important that we refocus and, and, and know that digital trade and digital platforms and services 
requires capacity, requires competences, requires data infrastructure, requires digital infrastructure, requires also making sure that the actors and agents have access to affordable, uh, usable technologies that can harness, for example, AI and natural language processing so that these platforms and services can be accessed in non-English or Arabic or French, but can be adaptive to the language of the local trade or indigenous trade people in their languages so that it can be democratized and easily accessible and usable for, for free flow of trade. I thank you so much. Ambassador, we thank you for your excellent contribution, which actually synthesized so many of the, all of the things that people have been saying here this afternoon. Um, I'd like to single out something that you had said, which maybe hasn't been covered yet, which is thinking about technologies for inclusive growth, whatever they may be, um, these emerging technologies, because there will be more of them, but looking at AI and blockchain, that, that's, that's what we hear now and reminding us in the priorities to think about the unconnected, think about the access to finance, think about the basics, think, so, think about what are those very basic legal frameworks which are going to differ from uh, country to country, but maybe again, uh, as we were saying earlier today, the regional groupings that might be able to make a difference like the AFCFTA. Um, with that, I know you can't stay with us too long and there may be questions for you in the room or online so I would like to know first, is there anyone in the room who has a specific question uh, for the ambassador? Okay, this is our friend from Sudan. We're going to give you the floor. Uh, your Excellency, thank you for your comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, in your role in the diplomacy, what role uh, is, is being played uh, in order to transcend the inherited uh, political barriers or geopolitical barriers in order to enhance the uh, uh, transboundary trade. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for that very, very important question. As you know, uh, there is a lot of efforts being made on, on, on negotiations and agreements on e-commerce. There needs to be uh, at the level of, of diplomacy in the multilaterals, uh, uh, courage and conviction and a change in mindset to be able to change the status quo, to realize that what trade was and the rules that govern trade um, in previous years are no more fit for purpose. And uh, there's also an importance to know that emerging technologies that have not worked its way into the multilateral processes and systems are a reality and must be factored. Also, member states in LDCs and developing countries must know that the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, these advancements in digital trade and e-commerce cannot wait forever, that we must have the courage and get engaged and negotiate and also make sure that the interest of SMEs, MSMEs, women and the youth who are in the trade value chain and ecosystem, uh, uh, their, their contextual requirements on data and the governance of data are factored in the negotiations so that it's a, it's, it will not be a zero sum game it may not be an optimal, but a positive sum game as we negotiate our way to ensure that the barriers for e-commerce and digital trade uh, to take root. The other point that I wanted to add is, as we engage at Geneva, at the multilaterals, we must also endeavor to engage the actors and agents in the policy space, in trade, in the new emerging digital economies so that there is a coordinated evidence-based and competency-based approach to build the data and digital infrastructure and processes and workflow uh, uh, in our countries. 
that um, being suspicious is not going to solve anything, but being realistic and doing what is required in terms of our capacity and our competency will be very important. I don't believe that um, uh, we cannot take a leadership role. I think um, LDCs and African countries, if they do or when they do the necessary to build the requisite infrastructure and remove the barriers and have a much more smarter policy and regulatory re regimes around data, around the flow of data, around the truly building of digital trade and e-commerce in our country that is bottom up will, will help us in the multilateral system. The challenge becomes when it is done elsewhere and brought in and it lacks context, then we have trust issues around the flow of data. But I think we need to be open, we need to engage, we need to collaborate, we need to partner because digital trade requires the global community to create value chains and to connect to global value chains. I hope that 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 uh, that makes sense to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Are there any other questions from the chat for the ambassador? Uh, no, we have no questions. Okay, no more questions. Um, I would like to say that was really important to say, LDCs in particular, get informed, stand up for yourselves. Um, and negotiate together within the AFCFTA and other regional frameworks. Um, with that, Ambassador, thank you very, very much for your contribution, and we hope to be hearing from you again. Uh, this will be available online so people can catch that, uh, that discussion that he's just had with us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, um, if there are other questions for the other panelists, um, I'm happy to take them. Michael Roberts from WTO had to uh, slip out. He had another very important engagement. The translators can stay on a bit longer. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to add in right away no, or? No, okay. Okay. And. Um, I just wanted to say in terms of connecting the dots, um, there's been mention of digitally, um, digital ministries that have been emerging. And I was just in Mongolia in September on a scoping mission for the next World Export Development Forum, which is going to take place in Mongolia. And uh, here is my partner from UNCTAD and let's talk about talking about connecting the dots. Uh, and it is really important and it is not easy at the national level for all of these different ministries in Mongolia is in all places. Um, and the challenges we're seeing with LDCs are also the challenges in uh, landlocked countries. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, where those priorities are and how we can get the low hanging fruit and move forward quickly. With that, other questions? I can see there's one right there. Uh, sorry. Your name and your organization, please, and then your question. Okay, I'm, I'm Tabang. I work for the Lesotho Mission. Lesotho Mission in Geneva. Lesotho, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, just a, a, a very short one. Um, I understand that, that we will be able to access the information that is that was shared today, but I am not too sure if I will have to search from the EIF website or ITC or W2. Uh, uh, I believe it's, it's EIF that will be sending out everything from the from. So you'll event. be sending out to the emails, or we certainly can to everyone registered. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, Simon, over to you. So, um, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, colleagues and friends, I think my role is the simpler one, uh, but dare I say just as important because it is really to sincerely thank everyone today for participating in this event, uh, our excellent moderator, our panelists, our participants here in Geneva, but also online 
and of course our wonderful interpreters. It's been a really enriching conversation about all the different challenges, the solutions, the priorities for maximizing the gains from digital trade. Uh, and I think importantly, what we also heard uh, about upgrading and even reinventing workforce skills for an increasingly digital world. I think in today's world where we so easily speak about frontier technologies, AI, blockchains, it's always useful to be reminded about the actual stark realities of the digital divide that we face. For our 56 members of the Commonwealth, uh, around half of our population are still offline. So, you know, as the ambassador said, the idea of an, a digital economy is an ideal aspiration for many, and we need to make that transition to reality. Globally, there are still wide differences in internet access and usage and significant differences in affordability. Uh, and we also know that women and girls are often disproportionately impacted by the digital divide. Uh, but let's also be positive uh, because there's also a promising story to tell. I think that's about the growing use in internet use around the world, particularly through mobile broadband, particularly in, in Africa. And we know that getting developing countries and LDCs online requires several foundational things that were emphasized today. Uh, these are affordable broadband, reasonably priced ICT hardware and services, investment in digital infrastructure, digital skills and IT literacy, and regulatory approaches to telecommunications to ensure affordability for everyone. So once people are online, they have access to these opportunities of digital trade and e-commerce. Uh, the Aid for Trade agenda, or what the WTO DG has called Investment for Trade, can play an important role in addressing some of these connectivity challenges. But an invigorated aid or investment for digital trade agenda must also help develop the softer part of the economy, the digital skills and the capabilities of SMEs and young entrepreneurs, especially for the platform economy, and develop an enabling regulatory framework for digital trade to flourish. So I just wanted to briefly highlight three issues that we heard today. Uh, the first is that there are many initiatives and partnerships underway to support the development of digital trade, and so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The onus on us is to really proactively, smartly leverage these existing partnerships like the E-Trade for All initiative to identify practical projects that will deliver real impact depending on countries' digital readiness and capacity. Second, we heard there's always a need for scaling up funding, uh, but it's important that small states and least developed countries are not bypassed in these financial flows. There's always room for improvement, co-financing, catalytic financing, blended financing, innovative partnerships, especially with the private sector, regional organizations, and regional development banks. Uh, and finally, uh, we perhaps need greater support for enabling trade in digitally deliverable services, which remains a hugely untapped area of potential for many developing countries, for small states, for small island developing states, and for least developed countries. And the ecosystem here and the capacity requirements needed for digital services may be somewhat different uh, from traditional e-commerce and goods. For example, there'd be more important issues around mutual recognition of qualifications, standards, data, and privacy policy. So let me conclude by sincerely thanking Ratnika and the Enhanced Integrated Framework for jointly organizing today's event uh, under our Memorandum of Understanding. I'm really happy that we've pulled it out and dusted it off, and we do need to keep the momentum going. Uh, we have an MOU with UNCTAD, so Torbjörn, we're coming for you next. <laughs> Uh, there's so much work to be done in the space and so much we need to do to support our member countries. So thank you everyone for attending today and for the inductive engagement and uh, good evening from our side. Thank you. That's Brendan Vickers from the International Trade Policy. He's the head of international trade policy because this is also a networking and connecting dots event. So I'm saying that for people online also as well as here. He didn't have time to take questions from the floor, but you can contact any of the partners, of course, uh, individually as well as EIF or the Commonwealth Secretariat who have jointly organized uh, this great event today. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you as well. Can you can I can I just recognize the contribution of our colleagues who did all the groundwork for this uh, for this event? Can I just you know before we close?